Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we'll be discussing the tapeworm. It's known as the beef tapeworm. The official name, of course, is Tinea saginata. Tapeworms are large organisms, as we learned in the introductory uh, presentation. And as a result, people have known about them for quite some time. So it's no surprise that during the 1700s, tapeworms attracted the attention of people who were interested in what are those things that came out in my stool? <laughs> so we had two of these people that were more than curious because they actually looked at the specimens and identified uh, portions of these worms that they could get their hands on, so to speak. And uh, indeed, uh, Tyson was the first to actually show through um, enlarged views of the worm that Tinea saginata uh, is a, a tapeworm which can contains four sucker discs, and he did a very good job of describing the general morphology. But it wasn't until Goza uh, decided to apply microscopy to the subject where the, the infrastructure, so to speak, of each tapeworm segment was described in detail. So these two gentlemen pioneered work that later on led to the discovery of the life cycle and control measures, etc. So it's, it's nice to know the origin of some of these things every now and then. So if we're calling this the beef tapeworm, uh, it's a little bit misleading because, in fact, this tapeworm adult lives in humans. So why do we call it the beef tapeworm? So we see here a very uh, lovely pastoral scene of uh, a French breed of cattle and uh, in puffy white clouds. And we can imagine these cattle living out a very peaceful life. There's only one bad day in their life, and that's the last one. And then the meat goes someplace. It goes to the slaughterhouse, obviously, and then to the butcher shop. And then finally, some of it might arrive on our table. And we, as a species, have learned to enjoy what we would call medium rare to rare beef. We prefer that, it seems, over all of the other styles of beef that uh, are available through world cuisines. So in this case, this is an English dish called Beef Wellington, named after Lord Wellington in his honor. And uh, as you see here, the meat that's been sliced off from this tenderloin is rare. This is not just medium rare. This is rare. <clears throat> and these little white flecks over here may or may not represent fat deposits or, well, as we'll see, it could actually be something else. But first, just to re reiterate what this tapeworm actually looks like, the scolex is diminutive compared to the rest of the worm, barely visible. But as we move down the length of this tapeworm and progress up through the immature to the mature proglottids and finally out into the gravid proglottids, the length and width of these segments uh, grow. And all of that energy is derived from our food that we eat. And this worm, the entire length of the worm, is capable of absorbing nutrients from our uh, ingested meals. Just to show you the scolex again, the Tyson observed first. You see the four suckers. There are no hooks. And if you look at the mature proglottid, uh, all of the organs are there, of course, the male and female, the uterus, the excretory um, system is there. It has muscle. These have actual motility associated with them, but no gut tract. The life cycle of Tinea saginata is rather straightforward, but it involves several stages. To begin with, it is acquired by eating raw or undercooked beef. The larval stage of the tapeworm is found within the meat. And that's the stage that we ingest in order to acquire the adult tapeworm. So here is a, a depiction of a portion of the meal containing these larval stages, and they're known as cystocerci or cystocircus. Each one of these is called a cystocircus. And it contains within it the um, immature proglottids and scolex of the adult worm. So as the worm is freed from the surrounding tissue by our digestive enzymes in the stomach, these 
pass into the small intestine. And even if we eat six or eight or ten of these at a meal, only one will succeed. We end up with a single tapeworm usually, and so there must be some competition for space and nutrients that eliminates the ones that don't succeed first. That's our conclusion, at least. This worm takes at least three months to achieve its full length. And as I showed before, these segments are just a portion of the adult worm. And you can see, if you were to line all these up, we might have 10 or 15 feet um, of that particular worm in that jar, and then there may be a little bit less in this one. But it's rare to actually get the entire worm out, and as we'll see, the, the drug that used to be used to treat these worms uh, used to dissolve the worms, so we never used to get anything. But today, we, the drugs are different. But anyway, let's continue with the life cycle. The adult worm lives attached to the small intestine by four sucker discs, as we've learned. And as we eat, the worm enjoys a portion of that same meal. Now, remarkably, as the meal passes down the small intestine, let's say our stomach is filled to about here with the meal that we just ingested. We're not going to ingest any more. And it, as it passes down around the worm, the worm detects the fact that, oh, the meal just ended, but I want some more. So what happens is the tapeworm detaches from the small intestine, and it migrates down a certain portion of the small intestine with the meal. It then continues to ingest, particularly around the neck of the worm, because that's the highest area of tissue generation for this adult tapeworm. And then as, as it exceeds its physiological limits in the small intestine, there must be some other environmental cues that tells the worm, you've gone too far, now crawl back to where you were before. And the worm then works its way slowly but surely all the way back up, attaching and reattaching and attaching and reattaching to the small intestine until it lies just below the pylorus, ready for the next meal. And that's the life of this worm. This worm causes almost no tissue damage to the host. In fact, Tinea saginata has no pathological effects whatsoever. It can live attached to the small intestine for up to 20 years. The segments of this worm, the end segments, the gravid proglottids containing the eggs that result from self-fertilization. And when I say self-fertilization, I mean that the entire colony is considered an adult worm. The worm, because it folds back on itself, the, each segment can exchange sperm with the segment adjacent to it. So the same segment doesn't fertilize the eggs, but adjacent segments can serve that purpose. These segments then mature and then are become gravid. And as I mentioned earlier in our uh, discussion about the general biology of tapeworms, each gravid proglottid can then detach from the host, uh, from, the, uh, from the colony, I should say, and exit the host. Because they're modal, these worm, this segment can actually crawl out of the anus. It doesn't have to be defecated in order to leave the host. It can actually crawl out on its own. So very often, patients will bring small uh, portions of segments to their physician, and they claim, well, I found this on my bed sheet. I don't know what it is. Uh, can you please help me? And in fact, it turns out to be a portion of the adult tapeworm that they've been harboring for many years without realizing it. These segments then must in some way contaminate the food that cattle ingest. Now, in most uh, ranch situations throughout the United States, and in, I would even say throughout uh, South America, particularly in Argentina, where a lot of beef is grown, or raised, I should say, the, the sanitary conditions are such that these events would probably never happen. But if we were to go to West Africa, where raising cattle is adjacent to poor sanitation areas, where human feces is a common contaminant of the environment, the rate of infection in West African cattle is quite high. So that's one endemic center that we know about, that um, when you travel to West Africa, you should be aware that ingesting raw or undercooked beef 
even though you're used to doing that, say within the United States or Canada or even throughout Central or South America, when you get to Africa, you've got to ask for your beef well done it, or you're running a risk of acquiring an adult tapeworm. It's as simple as that. Almost no other place in the world has an endemic center for um, Tania saginata. There used to be a lot of uh, tapeworm infection from Mexico, but that has since been um, corrected. And we'll say why when we come to the prevention and control section of this life cycle. So as the cattle ingest these eggs, inside of each of these eggs is a larva. It's called a hexacanth larva. It's got hooklets. Remember, the adult doesn't have any hooklets, but the larva does. The egg then hatches in the stomach of the cow. And remember, the cow has several stomachs. So the eggs have to go through an environmental cue system that tells it it's in the right place in the cow in order for it to hatch. The eggs then hatch, penetrate the wall of that of the intestine, and enter the blood supply. And there they are distributed throughout the cow. They could lodge in various places. Uh, they're not specific for muscle, although as I've mentioned earlier in some of these presentations, muscle tissue represents about 40% of the wet weight of an animal if you subtract the weight of the bones. So muscle tissue uh, is a favored site because it's heavily vascularized and it's a, it's a dominant tissue. But you could also find these cystocerci that develop in the tissue, in brain tissue, in the eye of the cow, in any of the organ systems, uh, in kidney, in liver. But primarily, uh, we don't ingest those portions of cattle uh, as much as we do the, the striated skeletal muscle or the meat of this, of this animal. And that's the way this infection behaves. So let's reiterate. We ingest the cystocircus, which it develops in the tissue of the cow as the result of the cow eating eggs from a contaminated environment in which human feces allowed these segments to pass into the environment from their adult tapeworms. These cystocerci then were uh, released from the meat in the stomach. They traveled to the small intestine and only one will end up succeeding in the small intestine to develop into adult tapeworm, which could take three to four months to, to accomplish. The segments are then passed out. They contaminate the environment of cattle, cattle, and there you have your life cycle. Now, the reason why I've spent so much time on this is because the, the, the next presentation involving Tania solium has an identical life cycle, and I, now I need to spend less time with that than I, than I would have necessarily had to had I not gone into the detail here. Identifying this parasite from stool samples is risky because, as I mentioned earlier on in the biology of this, the tineid tapeworms all have the same shaped egg. So I can't tell you whether this is a tinea saginata, a tinea solium egg, even an Iconococcus granulosus egg, they all look the same. So from those three tapeworms, I wouldn't know which one I was looking at. The Iconococcus I might know because if this isn't dog feces, that's not going to be a kind of caucus, but we'll get to that again when the life cycle comes up. So, with regards to cellular and molecular pathogenesis, Tadia saginata causes none of the above. And in terms of clinical disease, none of the above. Now, I have to qualify this because Imagine what you would feel like if you acquired an adult tapeworm and it turned out to be Tania saginata. It might elicit some psychological effects to know that you've got a 20-foot worm living in your small intestinal tract. So there may be some psychological effects of this um, acquisition process, but there is no physiological uh, process that the worm induces that would cause ill health to any of these infected individuals. So that's the good news about this parasite. It doesn't really uh, function as a, um, as a first-class parasite. Now, you might also want to argue that, well, what about all of the food that it absorbs from the host? Can't that take away from the nutrition of an individual? And it certainly can, particularly in children and young adults and living in uh, areas where there are um, protein-calorie malnutrition situations, an adult tapeworm can, could make a difference in terms of the outcome. Uh, with regards to the normal development of those people. But in most cases, 
Uh, that has not been documented. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. Today we have a 27-year-old female native New Yorker referred to the outpatient clinic at Columbia University Medical Center after reporting to her OBGYN that she has seen worms in her stool and underwear. She describes these worms, like those little quotes there, because we're not sure they are worms yet, but perhaps we, we think they might be. She says these worms are one to two inches in length, pale white in color. She also reports about two to three weeks of abdominal bloating. Uh, this um, 27 year old woman does report that she works for an NGO and that she does stints working at a refugee camp on the Ethiopia Sudan border. And I just sort of make note that both North and South Sudan border with Ethiopia. She reports taking part in the native celebrations and eating and drinking the food of the native people, such as kitfo, that's a steak tartare with melted butter. She took no mal malaria prophylaxis. Uh, she did not avoid swimming in fresh water. She did wear sandals rather than walking barefoot. The patient comes to clinic with a stool sample with a relatively flat, mo white, motile object that is approximately two centimeters in length. Um, and then she found this in her underwear that morning. So let's talk a little bit about clinical disease. Um, number one, number two, number three, I'm going to say asymptomatic. Most infections don't produce any symptoms. Um, there might be some epigastric fullness, but what I want to suggest is that if you see much in the way of symptoms, you want to be thinking about, um, is there something else going on? Okay. With that said, um, sometimes there can be complaints. Um, there can be abdominal issues. There can be a, a feeling of nausea after one eats and, um, not commonly, but there have been um, cases where people will vomit. Um, uh, proglottids can be seen, and I think this is the disturbing as um, as our case is representing. It, they may feel okay, but when they note proglottids in the stool, these sort of inchworm moving items in the stool, uh, that can be a bit disturbing. Um, sometimes the proglottids will migrate out of the infected person overnight and be discovered in the bedding or clothing the following morning. And so this is a somewhat disconcerting feature in that these proglottids will move in a manner very similar to inchworms. Now, what about diagnosis? Um, microscopy um, is, is probably the main way that we approach this. Um, and in this case, right, um, when you're being given the item, the gravid proglottids can be fixed and looked at under the microscope. Um, traditionally, they were injected with India ink um, using a 26 gauge needle. Um, nowadays, they're often staying with uh, hematoxyl and eosin. Just, I think that's more something more familiar in our, in our labs. Um, and the T saginata proglottids have 12 or more branches on each side of the uterus. Um, so we're just gonna talk a little bit about um, the different tinea um, um, proglottids. More than 12, uh, think of the beef tapeworm. Less than 12, you start moving into the pork tapeworm. And very few, and actually more broad than long, you start moving into the fish tapeworm. And the way I remembered this is when I was studying this in India one time, is I thought about how they hold the, uh, the cow up as a sacred animal. And um, so when the gods, this is just a, a memory trick, this is not actually true, I don't think it's true, is when the gods were, um, they had the opportunity to design these proglottids, the, the most esteemed, most artistic one got the beef tapeworm and he put 12 branches, even more, it was just beautiful. The one who did the pork one, um, you know, they, they couldn't over, outdo the one who's doing the beef one. So there was less than 12. And the one who had to do the fish one was just not very happy at all. So didn't do much of a job and it's sort of short square and not much going on. All right. Uh, you also can find the eggs, but the tinea eggs, whether it's saginato or solium or any of the tinea, um, you really can't visually tell them apart. But one of the little tricks, um, acid fast staining, um, the fully mature eggs of the Tinea saginata have an, have an acid fast shell. So if you do acid fast staining, um, or um, we'll talk about some other tests that allow you to distinguish them, but just visually under the microscope, you can't tell which tinea species it is looking at eggs, but you can looking at the gravid proglottids.
Um, what about the paddle test or sticky tape test? Um, as mentioned, because these proglottids are migrating out of the anus, you can actually end up with eggs that get expressed and remain on the perineum. And so the paddle test or sticky test that we often use for pinworm and Therobius vermicularis, that might be of help in detecting these, um, these eggs. There also are nucleic acid amplification um, tests. There's actually multiplex ones. So now you might go ahead and do your sort of GI um, panel and uh, you might pick up the diagnosis that way. Um, and there's an uh, ELISA test uh, that actually it's, it's detecting antigens in this case. So coproantigens is what we're calling them. So these are antigens in the stool rather than looking at the uh, immune response. So just a visual on these different um, testing modality. So we have the paddle test, right, as I discussed, where you can use that to pick stuff off. This is, you can just look at the beauty, beauty here and all these branches. So this was obviously the, um, the cow god was uh, making this one. Um, here, this could be either. It could be uh, tinea solium, tinea saginata. They look basically the same. Uh, this might be a way to test an ELISA test for the copro antigens and our good old um, thermocycler looking for um, the PCR, the amplification of uh, nucleic material. Here, another beautiful shot, and you can see more than 12 branches on each side. So you're not, you don't get to go one, two. This is one, two, three. You count them on just one side when you're doing the more than 12. Uh, what about treatment? Pretty straightforward and single dose is usually adequate. So praziquantel, uh, five to 10 milligrams per kilogram. Um, so you can think you're sort of in the in the four to 800 um, milligram dosing range there and niclosamide, uh, two grams PO times one, right? So think about the fact that we're, these are, we're going after luminal um, treatment here. We're not, not gonna be um, recommending the bendazoles quite as much as we would these. Um, and there, the treatment of choice is mentioned, the praziquantel. And the mode of action here is it's going to interfere with the invertebrate um, calcium ion channels. All right, what about our patient? Now, the object brought in was identified as a proglottid. Um, stool studies were also done revealing eggs. Uh, there was a GI biofilm array. This is a multiplex. Not only did it reveal that the patient had... Um, the beef tapeworm, uh, Tania saginata, but the person also had co-infection with, with giardiasis. So they were treated with praziquantel for the uh, Tania saginata. They were treated with metronidazole for giardiasis, and they did well. And I think here is the thought that because they had these um, symptoms of bloating, we didn't just stop with the, oh, this is beef tapeworm. Why did they have such significant symptoms? And I think the giardiasis um, explains that. Preventing and controlling tapeworm infections in humans is very, very simple. So we begin with the sanitary approach. Uh, water treatment plants, of course, to handle the feces and urine that are produced every day by large communities in rural, in urban situations, I should say. Or the good old outhouse is good enough, too, because this worm, once it's deposited in the bottom of the outhouse, has nowhere to go. It cannot escape. But there are public health measures that can be brought to bear which will control this infection at, a, at another level, at the community level as well. We can prevent cows from coming in contact with human feces just by maintaining good sanitary practices on ranches. If we suspect that the meat contains a stage of the infection, the cystocircus, and we still want to avoid it, we can freeze or cook all the beef until it's well done. And this approach is used in places like West Africa and in Mexico, where there are still endemic centers for the transmission of Tania saginata. And then finally, there is a federal meat inspection program. The United States has a very good one. And what they do is wherever the cattle will come from, and we used to import about 25,000 head of cattle. Oh, no, no, many, many more than that. Uh, in, in all of the cattle that we imported from Mexico at one point, when they did the meat inspection by cutting the cheeks of the slaughtered animals and exposing the muscle tissue in the masseter muscles, it was looked at as a good source for whether or not that cow was infected with a cystocircus. They're visible to the naked eye. They're about the size of the end of your little finger. And uh, they're quite uh, distinct because the meat is red and these little stages are white. 
so they're quite easy to seize. So a meat inspection program involving the slicing and opening of the cheek muscles <clears throat> was a very effective way of identifying cattle that had slipped through the, um, the sanitary approach to controlling the infection in Mexico, but we could still avoid uh, infection with it if we were to discard the carcasses that had a positive for cystic sarcosis. And of the, all of the cattle that were imported into the United States on an annual basis, we found about 25,000 head of cattle that actually contained cystic sarcosis um, as a result of infection with tinea sagenata. And I, th I think this is no longer the case. The, re the amount of infection in cows are greatly reduced, but still we have to be cautious about how we approach our meat if it's imported from places other than the United States or Canada. <clears throat> So that's the story for Tinea Sajanata, and the next time we meet, we'll discuss Tinea Solium. Thanks for listening.